OK, stop talking to each other. Uh, we're looking at Luke 15, uh, the famous story of the prodigal son. And um, just as a reminder, the book of Luke, you can think about it with two S's, where the first 19 or 20 chapters, Jesus is seeking the lost. Uh, the last section of the book, Jesus is saving the lost through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so uh, beginning around chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus begins making his journey to Jerusalem. In one of the previous classes, we looked at a bunch of verses that showed how it said as he was making his journey, as he was on his way, something like that. So during this journey where Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem to die and be buried and be raised, uh, there's a lot of unique things in the Gospel of Luke that are not in the other Gospels. So you get Jesus traveling with a group of people where some people, it seems like, walk away at times perhaps. There's other people uh, that are attaching to him and they're kind of observing what he's doing. This is one of those sections that we're looking at in Luke chapter 15. Uh, we, don't, we get other parts in the Gospels that talk about if the, a sheep goes away, then you leave the 99 and go after the one that went astray, things like that. But this is a very expanded version of some of those things that we see in other places. The outline of this chapter is pretty simple. The first seven verses show you the lost sheep, and then 8 through 10, the lost coin, and then 11 to 32 are, and I'm going to say the lost sons, uh, because I, I don't think it's just the prodigal that's lost, and I think that's one of the points of this parable, and we'll look at that in just a little bit. Um, just a couple overall themes or overall ideas that we're going to see from this chapter. Rejoicing is brought up, celebrating is brought up over finding things that were lost, and all of this obviously ends up pointing towards those who were lost in the Lord, and now they've been found, that there's a time to be rejoicing for that. Um, it, each of these parables have decreasing numbers. There's 100 total sheep, one's missing. There was 10 coins, and one of them is missing. There is one son that, well, there's actually two sons, but one, the one that gets emphasized, the one that did the prodigal living. So you have these decreasing numbers, but increasing importance. Sheep, money, and then sons. And so there's like in, this intensification going on that I think is leading towards in this chapter challenging the self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Um, I'm going to show why I say that when we look at the first couple verses. But the first couple verses are going to set up the context for who Jesus is addressing when he gives this famous parable. I remember shortly after I became a Christian, I started scouring the interwebs for sermons, and I would go to gospel meeting sermons, and I found a sermon from D. Bowman where he began by saying, turn your Bible to the 15th division of the Gospel of Luke. And I'm like, I've never heard it said that way before. And then he said, this chapter is a triplicate, and I had never heard that word before either. Um, it's three parables that are strung together that have the same meaning with this intensification going on. And so why is Jesus giving this triplicate in the 15th division of the Gospel of Luke? Um, let's look at the first, let's read the first two verses to get the context. And this, I want to spend a couple minutes emphasizing why this parable was given from these two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, if you look at the beginning of verse 3, so he told them this parable. Who is it that Jesus is hanging around in this passage? Yeah, like the gross people. Like the people that obviously have done a lot of bad things. And so one question that you could just ask yourself from this, are you, do you have the kind of uh, personality or the kind of love for people would be a more accurate way of saying this, that, that would ever attract a sinful person? Or are you one of those kind of like holier than thou, holy roller kind of people that's very judgmental towards anybody that doesn't meet your standards of things or meet, even meets God's standards of things? G Sinners and tax collectors were comfortable going to Jesus because of the time he would spend with them, the teaching he would give them, the patience he would show them, the grace that he offered them. 
And so when Jesus is hanging around people like this, what do the religious elite of the day, what's their reaction? Yeah, they're starting to grumble. And so the Pharisees, the scribes, like they're looking down on sinners. Jesus is looking for sinners. And so that's an interesting contrast. Are you looking to help people or are you just always looking down on people? And um, I don't know what kind of grumbling it could have been like. Maybe it's something like this. This is speculative. But maybe they were saying something like this. These kinds of people would never come to our Bible classes. Jesus must be tickling their ears or something like that. I don't know. But they're grumbling amongst each other that Jesus would ever spend time with people like this. It reminds me of Roy Radcliffe, the preacher in Wisconsin, who taught Jeffrey Dahmer, um, the guy that did a lot of unspeakable things in the early 90s. And Roy Radcliffe, the preacher at the church there in whatever town it was, uh, he started meeting with Jeffrey Dahmer in prison and he taught him the gospel and he was baptized. And if you listen to the interviews that Jeffrey Dahmer has after he became a Christian, that guy understands his own sin and owns up to it better than I do. Like, this guy, he became so honest with himself. But there were people at Roy Radcliffe's church that told him, if Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven, I don't want to be there. Like, if, if you had a close friend that started having Bible studies with certain kinds of people that you've classified as untouchable, would you look down on that person for spending time with folks like that? So do you see how this chapter begins by talking about this religious elitism, this, this, this kind of superior attitude? And I, this is important because the chapter is going to begin and end with this very attitude. It begins with self-righteous people, and it's going to end with the older brother when his prodigal brother returns home, and they're celebrating for him. He goes, well, what? nobody's ever done anything for me, and I deserve to have a lot of things done for me, and this, this guy that's wasted all of, all of that you gave him on prostitutes and all this kind of stuff, now you make a big celebration for him, but you've never done anything for me. That's exactly the kind of person that I think Jesus is addressing in this parable. Do you see that? And so we're going to see, ironically, that the prodigal son was lost, but then he's found. And the older brother is lost, it seems like, the whole time, even though though there's a lot of good things to say about him. So there's two ways to be lost. You can go out and do all the really, really bad things, or you can trust in your own righteousness and think that you're owed something because of all of your obedience. Now, we'll tease that out as we go through this, but I want to show that at the beginning of this class. Any comments or questions about that as we get into this? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep, good. All right, let's read verses 3 through 7. The first of the three of the triplicate. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. All right. Now, Jesus begins this by saying, What man of you, if you had a sheep that went astray, wouldn't go. Like, this is common knowledge. All of you guys know that this is what you would do if you had a sheep that was missing. And and Stephen pointed this out in the last class, that several of these chapters of Luke have shown that the people that Jesus speaks to have more concern for their animals than they do for people. And now he's bringing up this theme here again. And so these people, yeah, we would definitely go take care of one of those sheep that was lost. We'd have somebody stay behind with the other ones and take care of them. But I need to go find that one that's lost. If you do that for your sheep, how come you guys are criticizing me for going after those who are lost and spiritually broken? And so uh, think about this question from this. 
because what we're going to be doing, this, these parables layer on one another. So look at this question. In the parable, the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to find the lost one. What does this teach us about God's prioris- prioris- whatever, and his willingness to leave the majority for the sake of the one? How can we model this attitude of seeking out the lost in our lives? Prioritization. Right, yeah, there, there's, there needs to be an urgency for ones that, that are lost. Um, good, how else could we tease this out? Yeah, the, like, if, if you're going to do triage where you're determining who has the biggest need right now, well, if there's people that are living in habitual sin and stuff like that, and, you, and you're coming to the assembly and you're just rubbing shoulders with people that you're already really good friends with, but you're never going to those who have urgent need or you're never reaching out to those who are never here anymore, that sort of thing. Um, you wouldn't do that literally with your sheep. Why are you guys criticizing Jesus for hanging out with people that need help? Um, you guys don't understand God's perspective on lost sheep and the priority of going and helping them. Now, I don't think Jesus is indicating in this, like in verse 7, that the, the tax collectors and sinners are in no need of repentance. But that's what they think about themselves. So, any, any other thoughts or comments about that? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Now, um, I... Uh, all right, any other comments? The wor- yeah, the worth of a single soul to, to, to go make all kinds of efforts to go, to go and find that one. Um, good, good. Anything else on this? Yeah, they were irredeemable. Like, these, these are tax collectors, and these are probably prostitutes and sinners and all this kind of stuff. Like, there, there's no way these people could ever get right with God. Brian? It's part of the lack of urgency. Like, you're asking people, they're very quick to lose focus. They're like, really, they're a lot better about themselves by coming. Because we're like, once we get that, um, we're like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's like, oh, it's pretty easy. Free elbow, free bowl. Yeah, like, if you were going to interview a tax collector or a sinner, if a psychologist was going to sit down and talk to them about their self-image, do you think that... Um, they would get pretty high scores on their self-image. Really high. Okay, all right, so a lot of people today would say, oh, that's great, you've got a high self-image, that's awesome. All right, the follow-up question is, why do you have a high self-image? Well, because a lot of other people stink, and I'm better than them. Okay, well, that's arrogance now. So look, look how, this, how this gets expanded on in verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found ten that I, uh, I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All right, um, what was lost here? One coin, one out of ten silver coins. Now, if you read what different people say about what these coins were, there are some things that you can say that preach good, and then there's other things that don't preach as good. And so, like, here's here's what some people have suggested. The lost coin may have been part of a set that made it more valuable, perhaps as part of a headdress that was a component of a woman's dowry handed down to her from her family. So some people have said that one of these coins would have been part of a dowry, and if you were wanting to be married one day, that if one of the coins was missing, it would be harder to find a spouse, and so it's not just an economic loss. This is a really big deal. Um, by the way, that commentator went on to say in that, on that same page 
that um, that's not likely though, and that what's more likely is that this is just a severe economic hardship on her because you know in this this little story she doesn't seem to have much of a house. She can light a lamp and it's it's lit and things like so. It's just like imagine more so a huge economic loss. All right, so um, yeah, I don't know. You got your four hundred one k. Two thousand eight happens all over again. You had. Uh, 600,000 in your 401k and now it gets down to 270. Uh, that's a big deal. And so what is it that she does? Yeah, like look at the verbs. She, she lights a lamp, she sweeps the house, she seeks diligently. Look at all, this is not something to be passive over. And so look at this question. The parable portrays the woman as actively searching for the lost coin. How does this illustration encourage us to take an active role in seeking out those who are spiritually lost? What are some practical ways we can participate in this effort? What is it? What is hair on fire? Okay, so you got it. To, it's really urgent. Good. What else? Right. Yeah, w one application of this that we can't miss, that includes everybody here, is if you know that there's a member here that is not showing up and they haven't been here or it's really inconsistent or something like that, like sending a text or calling them or sending them an email and asking, hey, like, we haven't seen you for a while. Is everything okay? And now we've got technology that we don't even have to light a lamp. We just have to turn on our phone. Uh, and just send a text and stuff like, but are we doing things like that? Good. What else? Jim. Right. Good. Yeah. Like if you see people like falling away or like not having the kind of commitment that they're supposed to have. You notice that Jesus, when he talks about this, in the face of losing a coin, in the face of losing a sheep, don't use that as an excuse to just, oh, I'm so discouraged right now, nobody else has the zeal that they ought to have, blah, blah, blah. No, you go and help, especially if you've got the eyes to see that. Good, what else? Good, good. And so one layer of application to this would be people that we know here that are not doing spiritually well. Another layer of application to this would be people that, you've, that, that are in the community that are lost and making efforts to try to help people know the Lord. Now, this is where I think these verbs become important. Lighting a lamp, sweeping a house, seeking diligently. It doesn't say that she just sat on a couch and just looked around and hoped to passively find it. Is that ever our perspective on evangelism, though? You know, we got a sign, and people can see the church building. And, like, if people want to know where the truth is, they know where to come find it. I've heard people talk that way before, which is not in any way what Jesus is saying here. If you're not proactively trying to find people to study with and influence, you're not going to just accidentally find it. And so there's got to be intentionality there with that as well. All right, any, anything else you guys want to say about this one? All right, notice in both of these so far, there's this invitation to rejoice in verse 6. The guy finds the sheep that was gone, rejoice with me. And then in verse 9, the woman says, rejoice with me. Can you see what, why that's being emphasized so far in this context when you go back to the first two verses? Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, and they're grumbling, and then Jesus gives a couple 
parables where he says, rejoice with me, rejoice with me. What's wrong with you guys? Now, let me, I'll go ahead and say something I was going to say earlier. I've seen this happen before with a preacher that I know, where there is a preacher that had so many studies with non-Christians in the community that he didn't have as much time to visit the orphans or the, or the widows in a congregation and like hang out with certain older members that were more shut in and stuff like that. That's an important thing to do. I'm not taking away from that at all. But in a local church, what would this passage say about neglecting those who are lost for the sake of those who are okay and by the way, lots of members could help and encourage. Why does it have to be the guy who's being paid to teach the Bible? Now, I understand that in saying that, some of that can sound ugly. I, I, again, I don't mean in any of that in an ugly way. But if you're, if you're booked up trying to help those in need, that's kind of what the expectation is. And so in a local church, should, say, for example, a preacher be criticized for studying with those who are lost and maybe not being able to spend as much time with every member in the congregation. What do you think? Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. So everybody's got their, their talents, the things that they're tasked with doing. And none, that doesn't mean that that part of the work is unimportant or that part's unimportant. It's all important. But it's a matter of us all working together. And so... You know, what, what happens in a local church when, for example, and this is just an illustration that departs a little bit from what we're looking at here, but let's say that in a local church, all the people who, who are good at song leading are never doing it. What kind of song leaders do we end up getting? Guys who shouldn't be doing it. And so what, if, if we're not allowing each other to stay in our lanes and do the work that is set before us and all that sort of thing, then you create all kinds of problems in a local church. So, all right, anything else you guys want to say about any of that? Yeah. In the sense that, like, women have a role to play as well, or in... Yeah, everybody's doing what they can. You got this guy that's out in the field, you got this woman that's at a house... You know, like, everybody's got a part to play. And in this context, everybody's got a part to play even when it comes to reaching the lost. And we've talked about some of that in prior classes. So. All right, anything else on that? All right, let's keep going then. And we look at the lost sons. I have the wrong, I, I, that should say 11 to 32 up there. Um, all right, let's start out with verses 11 to 16. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the, his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. All right. So you got a man with two sons. Uh, the younger one is going to be lost because of his prodigal living. And the older one is going to be lost because of his self-righteousness. So again, I, I want to keep emphasizing that. Both of the sons are lost in this story. One of them ends up being recovered. And so the, the, the father lets this younger son leave. What would it mean for a son to go up to his dad and say, hey, I want everything that's coming to me? What's he implying about his dad? You're as good as dead. Like, I've just, I've been waiting for you to croak. It's not happening soon enough. 
And so can I just have everything that's coming to me now? Um, the father lets him go. It's like the father didn't lower the standards to go, okay, let's, let, let's retool some things. Let's cater to your bad attitude, that sort of thing. He says, okay, go ahead, uh, do what you want to do. Um, so he, this guy, this kid wanted the father's things, but he didn't want the father. By the way, could we ever be that way with God? I'd sure like to have nice things, but I don't know if I really am interested in God. Um, and so... He, where does he go in this passage? Yeah, he goes to a faraway country. Like, out of the surveillance of my dad, um, I want to be away from his, his watchful eye. And what does he do with all the money? Yeah, he wastes it on reckless living. The text doesn't say here what he did with the, that money. His older brother accuses of him of hanging out with prostitutes later on in the chapter. Um, but it just kind of like, well, wh whatever that might mean, he just wasted all of it. Now, notice in verse 14, what kind of circumstances does he find himself in now? A severe famine. Now, this is a parable. A lot of this is metaphorical. What do you find to be metaphorical about him being in a prodigal way of living, a wasteful way of living, and he finds himself in a severe famine. Do you suppose that's a way of picturing his spiritual state now? You got nothing. Like, look at, look at these circumstances that you've put yourself into, and he hits rock bottom when he looked at, he was jealous of what the pigs were eating. Have you ever gotten that destitute where you drove past one of these farms in Bowling Green, like, I sure wish I could have what those pigs were eating right now? Um... This shows you how crazy sin is. Like, you thought that freedom was going to be found by fleeing from God. You thought that freedom in the parable and what it all means. You thought true freedom was going to be found by detaching from the Lord. You thought it was going to be by getting away from all the rules. And all you found is a greater kind of slavery than you ever could have imagined. This is what, one of the biggest critiques that people have, that secular people have of Christianity is that it's a straitjacket. Uh, Christianity says that I can't do this and I can't do that and it takes away all my fun. All right, who's more enslaved? Or what form of slavery is worse? Somebody who's enslaved to Christ and they do th things for the Lord over the weekend and they go to church with God's people or the person who can't wait till Friday to get drunk. And then they're just wasted all weekend. Who, what form of slavery is, is harsher? We all know. But one of the biggest lies that we sometimes believe is that true freedom is going to be found by getting away from all of this. Just detaching from all of it. Okay, good luck. You're not going to hack the system though. And so, anything you guys want to say up to verse 16? The older brother would have gotten double portion, so it would have been broken into three parts. Two parts go to the older, one to the younger. Maybe he, like, gives him money for all the livestock, and he's not walking around with all his livestock. Or maybe, maybe he is, he's got, like, a bunch of animals behind him, like, hey, can I trade you this thing for all that beer? So I don't know what it was, but, like, however that worked, it was all used in bad ways. But, yeah, the, like, the father does a lot of work, I think, to accommodate for what the son is asking for. So, all right. Uh, look at verses 17 through 24. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. All right. Um, what... What is this prodigal son thinking and doing in his mind in verses 17 through 19? Yeah, I'm going to go back and work. Um, Because if I'm just a worker, my father's hired servants have it better than I'm ever going to get it, even if I'm just a worker for my dad or something like that. And so beginning in verse 18 and going through verse 19, he has this speech that he's like, you know, as he's scribbling it down, and he like keeps reciting this, like getting it crafted exactly like he wants it to, to be able to go to his father and have the right words to say. Like, so when he says, okay, I'm going to say this to, to him, I'm going to go to him, and I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Like, he, I can imagine him just like reciting that over to himself again and again and again. Okay, those are the words that I'm going to say. Now, keep that in your mind for, for just a moment. How nervous do you think this guy would be in coming back to his dad? Okay. Imagine for a moment having fallen away and you've been away from the Lord for a few years and uh, you finally muster up the strength to, drive, to wake up early enough on a Sunday morning and I'm going to drive and I'm going to go to that church building that I used to go to And I know that when I get there, people are going to have all kinds of questions for me. I know that there's going to be all kinds of concerns. What what do you feel as you drive up to the driveway of the church building? What kinds of things are on your mind? What was that? Yeah, I've been a terror. What else? Yeah, like, are are they going to really embrace me again? Like, how's this going to go? Like... One of the things that, a preacher told me this story one time, and I may have shared this before, of a girl that had fallen away at a church, and she had been away for, I don't know, a year or something like that, and she finally mustered up the strength to come back to the building on a Sunday morning, and I don't know what exactly she was wearing but by somebody's standards in the church building, she, she felt like it was too immodest. And so she's coming into the door, and the first person she meets glares at her and goes, what are you doing coming back wearing that? Is there a time and place to talk about modesty? Is that the time to talk about it? No. Do you think she ever came back? Try to think about how gentle and how serious and how sober-minded you've got to be in handling somebody who's finally mustered up the strength to say, I will study the Bible with you, or I'm going to come back and hang out with those people again and just see how that goes. And so this trip, you can imagine the son, this son, he went to a faraway country. That means he's got a faraway journey to get back to where he came from. And I, don't, I can imagine all the kind of consternation that if this story were literal... What would be going on in his mind? So as he comes, you can imagine him like getting closer and closer, and maybe he sees the big old farm like in the, way off in the distance. He's like, yeah, that's, I remember the last time I looked at that and, and all the mistakes that I made and where I am now. But his father's looking out too. Look at, one of the things that this parable does is it redefines what, what a picture of a father is. This father is longingly looking out for this son that just took a third of the inheritance and he blew it all on terrible things. And here he is, tenderly, lovingly, waiting for that son, just looking out for him to come. And it's not just that, but when the father sees him, the father runs to the son. Adults in this culture don't run. That's not something that adults did. Looks like a little kid. Can you imagine him running through his little, his little village or whatever it was that he lived in with this big farm and everybody knows that this is a distinguished guy and all this kind of stuff and all the people are sitting out their porches looking at this guy running. going, What is this guy doing? He's going out to that guy? 
We all remember the shame that he brought on that family. Now, remember what it was that the son was reciting to himself? He had this little speech planned. Did you notice how far he got into that speech in verse 21? Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, when he was going to recite all of this in verse 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He doesn't get to that part, treat me as one of your hired servants. As it, it's as if he just gets interrupted before he can even recite the whole speech. Can you imagine the father running out and like he hugs him. He goes, okay, father, I have something to tell you. Get the fatted calf. Everybody, I don't, I don't care what you're saying right now. Like everything's good. I'm glad to see you again. We, I don't need to hear your little speech. Let's just celebrate. Um, look, look at this question. The father's response to the returning son is filled with love and compassion. How can we learn from the father's example in terms of forgiveness and restoration? Yeah, Dylan? All right. Yeah, yeah, maybe the son, like, oh, why is he running towards me or something like that? He could, that could be terrifying too, yeah. But what do you guys think about this question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and th this is a picture, by the way. Like, if there's anybody here that's been committing secret sin and you keep coming here and you keep feeling guilty and you haven't told anybody about what you've been doing, look at this picture of God. If you will come to your senses and realize that true freedom has not been found in your sin. Is there any question that he won't receive you back? Is there any question about that? There is no question about that. It does not matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've done those things. Anybody can be restored back to God. Matt? Matt? Right. Right. It, it does not matter what you've done. Anybody can come to the Lord. And so when people say, like, you know, I, I just don't know that God could actually forgive me, it, you're believing a lie that Satan wants you to believe. And so, all right, so this is all beautiful, but remember how this chapter started. Jesus is hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners. So look at how this chapter rounds out. Look at verses 25 to 32. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what, uh, and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go, to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, 
You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. All right. Reaction of the older brother. What's going on? What, what is all this? Yeah, uh, your brother came back, and his immediate reaction is just anger. You know, I tried to emphasize it as I was reading. He's talking to his dad. This son of yours, not this brother of mine. The son of di- distancing himself from this disgusting guy. He, he, he shows, I, I've expected a lot more out of you, Dad. Look at all the things that I've, I've, I've always been there for you. I've always obeyed you, Father. I've always had all these things in a row like you wanted me to. And so, um, why it's just not fair that you do this for this guy, but you wouldn't do it for me. Um, it, it's as if this older brother thought that he had earned everything. Can we ever have that attitude? We're like, you know, you know, you maybe remember back to the day that you first became a Christian. You're like, oh, wow, God's grace is so great. And then years go by, and you put all this work into your Bible study, and you put all this work into growing your character, and you do this, and you do that, and you make good decisions, and you start growing. Uh, and you can start to think, well, this is because of me. Like, look at all these things that I've done. And then you see somebody who's a new convert, and people are showering praises on the new convert, going, nobody's ever done this kind of stuff for me. Um, like I said with that story before, it's a good thing that the prodigal son didn't meet his brother first with this kind of attitude. Now, look at this question. The older son's reaction reveals his resentment toward his brother's restoration. How can, re- how can we relate to the older son's struggle with jealousy and self-righteousness? You know, this is a harder thing to admit. Like, it's, uh, it's easy to admit, oh, I got anger problems, because that implies everybody's a bad driver, and that implies all the politicians are dumb, and that implies things around me are really bad. It's really hard to admit that you're jealous and envious, because that's all within you. But how can we relate to this? Like, I didn't murder and eat 17 people. What's up with this? How come I don't have a higher place in heaven? Yes, very transactional relationship with God. God, I've served you. I've, I've been to church 104 times this year, plus Wednesdays, so whatever that would be. Like, I'm like a super Christian. Like, how, like I for sure oh, earned my way, yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the, like, he already got his inheritance. Why, why the fatted calf, that's like, th- that has something to do with me now. And the, the, the father's response, very tender, by the way, he says, you've always had what's mine. You've been with me. Wasn't being with me something that you treasured? As if, like, you did get, you, he, the, the prodigal son did gain something. He did get to go all, do all these worldly things that sound kind of attractive at times. And then he comes back and he gets all this. Well, he wasn't with the father that whole time. How much do you treasure being with the father? Wes?
Yes. But this shows you there's two ways to be lost. You can be lost like the tax collectors and the sinners, or you can be lost like a self-righteous Pharisee who knows your Bible inside and out. There's two ways to be lost. And the way that you're saved is resting in God's grace, doing what he said out of obedience because of what he's done for you. Final thing, I'm just going to put this up quick. This is not the point of this story, but there's, it's a, a, kind of an appendix thing. Some lessons for parents. Good families can have bad kids. Bad kids don't always stay bad. The good kid may not be so good in your family, and the father didn't give up. And so those are some quick things that might be helpful. Thanks for the good discussion.